And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Apek. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So the Ark of the Covenant, I'm sorry, so the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. As soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that the earth resounded. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, What does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come to the camp, the Philistines were afraid, for they said, A God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us, who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines. Least you become slaves to the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated, and they fled, every man to his home. And there was a great slaughter, for 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. And the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni, or Hophni and Phinehas, died. Hearing this part of the text read aloud, I realize how depressing it is. <laughs> and so as we move through the text, let's keep in mind, there is something that comes after this. Uh, God is a God of victory, but, but I want to talk about this victory this morning in the context of, of defeat. Um, how many of you, uh, myself included, right, how many of you have ever felt defeated in life? <laughs> right? We feel defeated in life often, probably far more often than we just feel victorious and feel like we've overcome something. We, just, we are a defeated people. All people are a defeated people. And we are always thinking to ourselves, if I could just claim victory over this thing in my life, or if I could just overcome this thing in my life, uh, then, then things would be okay and things would be good and I would be able to live a more fulfilling life. Brothers and sisters, the text for this morning is full of defeat. And so this morning we are going to talk about defeat together. I became a Christian when I was 15 years old. I gave my life to Christ. He claimed his victory in my life and I surrendered to him. It was not until I was 20 years old that I began to seriously study the Bible. And so from the moment I was 15 to the moment I was 20, I would hear the word presented and I would read the Bible. In fact, I read the Bible through several times, but I never really studied 
the Bible, like really studied, paid attention to what the Bible, what the Bible is getting at, what it means, what this part of the story is doing, paying attention to the truth about God. I just listened and I just read. When I was 20 years old, I, I began to seriously study the Bible, connect the dots, pay attention to what the whole story, all of Scripture is one story. I began to pay attention to what the whole story was saying, and I was trying to understand deeply what God was saying in, in His Word, in His Bible, that He had inspired. And I remember just every time I opened up the copy of God's Word that God had given me, and spent time in serious study, every single time, I was defeated, and I was called to change something about what I believed, and, and my heart was changing, and this process was, was painful. We wonder why there are so many shallow Christians in our day. It's because reading the Bible, it cuts us. The scripture is a sword. That's how it describes itself, right? And so seriously studying the Word of, of, of God and, and, being, and being changed and being, being consumed by the Word of, of love that God has given us, the 66-book love letter that He has written to us. And every time I opened its pages, I've been defeated. And this last week, I've been kind of compiling most of the biblical study, biblical work that I've done over the, over the last nine years. And I, I realized in this that, man, I feel like I still have just barely scratched the surface of what God has to say. Most of the Bible, I, I have not gotten to it yet in serious study. There just hasn't been time in my, my, my short life <laughs> so far. And I don't know if there will be enough time on this earth to just really study the whole of Scripture. I, I wish there was more time. But then also I know we have eternity with Christ, and so there, there will be time. But I realize how, how desperately deficient I am. Right? The same truth rings true in, in my ministry. When I was in college, I, I set forth with a dream and a plan to make a ministry for myself. And today I look at where I am, it's nothing like what I wanted. <laughs> it's nothing like what I planned to do. It's nothing like what I dreamed, but, but I think it's better. But over the course of my ministry, almost at every single juncture, God has taken the time to defeat me, to ruin, to ruin my life, to ruin the plans that I have made. And to establish His plan and His will and His direction for my life at every turn. And now I get to, now I get to serve pastors around the globe. Katie and I, this week, we even made a list of, of people we're ministering to around the world in places like Uganda and Liberia and Kenya and Ghana and India. And that's cool, but it's not something that I did. <laughs> you know? God chooses us and calls us, and He establishes the work of our lives like we learned last week. And, and our plans are defeated. And our, our theology is defeated. And our thoughts and beliefs are defeated. And we've seen, as we've studied through 1 Samuel, that this is the work that God is doing. And then, and then when I listen to like most people in the world talking about the work that God is doing, they're, they're talking about this, oh, you can claim victory in Jesus Christ. Just claim victory in Jesus Christ. You can be an overcomer. God will strengthen you and he will empower you. And, he, and I'm like, that is not the experience that I've had with God at all. Like that is completely the opposite of, of what I have experienced. Then we read texts like this in the Bible where God is, defeating the Israelites before the Philistines. And it's like, where does this, where does this gospel of personal victory come from? Like, where did people get this idea? And why did people start preaching and proclaiming this idea that people are to be exalted as some sort of victory? 
Whereas the Holy Spirit moves in our lives and God does His work and Christ leads His people and we see Him defeating the Israelites. As we dive into this text this morning and, and thank you, sister, for reading. That was short notice for her. Uh, it was an emergency and I went to her and I begged, will you please read? <laughs> thank you for reading. Okay, yeah. <laughs> thank you for reading. As we dive into this text, we're going to look at it in three parts. Uh, first, we'll just look at verse 1 and we'll ask ourselves, who are these people called the Philistines? And so we'll talk about who the Philistines were. Then we'll look at verses 2 and 3 and, and we'll see the difference between the work that God is doing and the work that, w that we try to do for ourselves. And, and then we'll look at verse 4 through, through verse 11 and, and we'll see what the evidence is of of God's true and real work on this earth and in our lives. First of all, we see verse 1. Verse 1 is always a good place to start, so this is where we're going to start. Thus, the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Remember, in the last chapter, Samuel was established as God's prophet. God had already said in, in chapter 2, toward the end of chapter 2, that he was taking on the responsibility upon himself. God is doing this work to raise up a faithful priest who will do all that is in his heart and who will do all that is in his soul or his mind. And in chapter 3, we actually see God with the boy Samuel, who by his providence, God brought the boy Samuel into the temple and was sure to have the boy Samuel being raised by a priest, learning the things of the priest. He was serving God as a little priest, even wearing the garments of a priest as he served before the Lord. And God was raising up Samuel. Samuel would be this prophet, this faithful priest that God was raising up to do all that was in God's heart and in God's soul. Thus, the word of Samuel came to all of Israel. Samuel was Israel's prophet. Now Israel went out to meet the Philistines. We begin another chapter, and I don't know how long this is after Samuel is established as a prophet. The text doesn't give us that information. But, but Israel went out to meet the Philistines in battle and camped beside Ebenezer, while the Philistines camped in Aphek. Who were the Philistines? Now, this is the first time we see the Philistines described in 1 Samuel uh, in this uh, book of history, this narrative that we are walking through together. But it is not the last time that we will see the Philistines. David will struggle with the Philistines. Saul, before David, will struggle with the Philistines. The Philistines become this dominant enemy of the Israelites. The Philistines lived in, in a province called Philistia or the states of the Philistines, you know, depending on which map you choose to look at, but this place called Philistia that was just south of the territory of Dan, and it was just west of the territory of Judah. So if you know where Judah is, where Bethlehem is in there, and Jerusalem is in there, it was directly to the west of where Jerusalem is now. Uh, Philistia is no longer, this is, this is Israel now. It is northeast of the Sinai Peninsula, but this is where, where the Philistines lived, the territory in, in which they lived. It was in the land of Canaan. Now, if you remember the story leading up to 1 Samuel in, in Exodus, Moses leads the Israelites out of, out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And God promises the Israelites the land of Canaan. Of course, he... He had promised them the land of Canaan 400 years before they came out of Egypt to, to Abraham, who would become the father of the Israelites. He said, you will have the land of Canaan. When Joshua, who, who was Moses' successor, took the Israelites into the land of Canaan, God gave them a command. And the command was, remove all of the people in the land of Canaan from the land of Canaan and destroy all of the idols. 
Yeah, we get to 1 Samuel and we see that the Philistines are, are still struggling against the Israelites. This is kind of a regular thing that would happen, right? The Philistines would come up out of Philistia and the Israelites would go to war against the Philistines. It's like probably a daily matter that Israel was skirmishing with the Philistines by this point. And we just have to wonder why in the world here 300, 300 years have gone by and the Philistines are still in the land of, of Canaan. Look with me at Judges. Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Now, the angel of the Lord. This is the pre-incarnate Christ. Uh, this is Jesus delivering God's message. Remember, uh, the Father is the one who ordains all things, the one who predestines, uh, the one who wills, and the Son Jesus Christ is the one who reveals. He is the one who always delivers the word of the Lord, even to the prophets. Isaiah identifies Jesus, even though he doesn't call him by name, as the one delivering God's message to the prophets. And then the Holy Spirit is the member of the Godhead who does the effectual work of God. Now the angel of the Lord, this is Jesus, before he was born to Mary. Now the angel of the Lord came from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up out of Egypt. Who did? Jesus. I did. Jesus is God. I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land which I have sworn to your fathers. And I said, Jesus, I will never break my covenant with you. Verse 2, And as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars. These are the instructions that Jesus gave to the Israelites as the Israelites went into the land of Canaan. But, says Jesus, you have not obeyed me. What is this you have done? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you. So we we begin to see why the Philistines are still in the land. Jesus says, I will not drive them out before you. But they, the people living in the land of Canaan, they will become as thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a snare to you. And when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the sons of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and they wept. So they named that place Bochim, and there they sacrificed to the Lord. Do you see what is going on here? That God, in His ordination, and Jesus in His revelation, said that He was leaving the Philistines in the land of Canaan. And there were some other tribes present too, but the Philistines, they're the, the prominent tribe that we see through the book of First Samuel. God was leaving the Philistines in the land so that they, the natives, the Canaanite natives, would be a thorn in Israel's side. And God was doing this so that the gods of the Philistines, of the Canaanites, would be a snare to the Israelites, his chosen national people. And so we see from the start, we see from, from 1 Samuel chapter 4 in verse 1 that, that God is the one working all this together. And we've seen this theme so far in, in chapters 1, 2, and 3 of 1 Samuel, the theme of God's providence, the theme of, of God's working all things together. We have... We have seen this plainly. And we know now that the Philistines were left in the land by God. God chose not to drive them out so that they would be a thorn in the sides of the Israelites. So that the Israelites would, would not become too efficient. So that the Israelites would would struggle so that the Israelites here in 1 Samuel chapter 4 would be defeated 
according to God's own will and according to God's own providence and according to God's working all things together. And as we work through this part of the text, this, this, this truth is just going to become more and more prominent. And just as a matter of brief application, I have to ask this, what, what enemies has God left in the land today? And of course, Israel has many enemies today. That is no secret. But his true church also has many enemies today. And we have to believe, if, if we say that it is God who works all things together for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose, we have to believe that this God who works all things together leaves enemies in the land according to His good purpose, according to His will, and according to His plan as we experience defeat. Right? What are some enemies that we face today as a church and as individuals. This might be applied to sickness, even though that's not exactly what the text is getting at. This can be applied to the existence of false, unhealthy churches who don't preach the gospel. Why doesn't God just take them out? This is why. This could be applied to things like militant Islam. Hindu extremists. It could be applied to those things around the world. This could be applied to dissension, division within God's church. This could be applied to views that dissent from the Bible in academia, in intelligentsia, in the school system, in the university. This could be applied to all of those things. God, who has authority over all things, God is the one who leaves enemies in the land. And He does this according to the Scriptures as a whole for the, for the good of His people. Don't, don't let this truth, this biblical truth, escape us this morning. Now, when we experience conflict in this world, it is by design for our good. When we experience hardship in this world, it is by design for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Look at verses 2 and 3 here in 1 Samuel chapter 4. We'll compare what God is doing, God's work and, and, and our work. Verse 2, the Philistines drew up in battle array to meet Israel. This is like some of our favorite movies. They ought to just make some of this into, into movies. This would be better than the stuff that's coming out, right? The Philistines drew up in battle array to meet Israel. They're coming. When the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the battlefield. Those are high stakes. Verse 3, When the people came into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? The elders of Israel, they, they gave direct credit to God. It was immediate. The elders said, why has God defeated us before the Philistines today? As we've already discovered in, in 1 Samuel chapters 1 through, through 3, particularly in, in chapter 2, right, during Hannah's prayer, we, we see that the Israelites had this very robust theology of God's sovereignty. In fact, let's just return to 1 Samuel chapter 2. And we'll look at some of the things that Hannah says in her prayer. First of all, she says in verse 2, There is no one holy like the Lord. The Lord's, Yahweh's, God's holiness is His central attribute. This is the 
thing that motivates him according to who he is. He is holy. He is the one who receives all glory. All attention is on, on God. He is holy. There is no one holy like the Lord. We'll look down to verse 4 and, and, and Hannah and her praise to God. is saying that the bows of the mighty are shattered, but the feeble gird on strength. It is God who weakens. It is God who strengthens. And he, he does so according to his will. He makes the weak strong and he makes the strong weak. This is something that God is doing. He's defeating people. He's in the business of defeating people. He is also in, in the business of giving victory according to his will and strengthening people according to his will. Verse 6, the Lord kills and the Lord makes alive. This, this is something that is under God's authority. And this is, this is a theology of the Israelites at, at this time. That is why they immediately recognize God as the one who defeated us. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol, the place of the dead, and raises up. Then in verse 10 we see, those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. Against them He will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. Uh, this is the theology that is described. And if, and if you want a, a deeper explanation of Hannah's prayer, then just go back and look up that sermon. We, we got to chapter 2 before we're here in chapter, in chapter 4. This is the theology that the Israelites are, are, are working with. God is sovereign over life and death and heaven and hell. It's God. God is the one who brings defeat. God is the one who gives victory. It's all God. God is the one who foreordains all of these things according to His own will. We continue in verse 3. After the elders of Israel admit, the Lord has defeated us before the Philistines, then they say, and try not to laugh when I read this, let us take to ourselves from Shiloh the ark of the covenant of the Lord that it, the ark, may come among us and deliver us from the power of our enemies. So you have a people who say, God is sovereign, God controls all things. Now let us try and do this thing and bring this thing so we can win the victory. <laughs> it seems to be contradictory. There seems to be a disconnect here, right, between theology and action. People seem to be maybe a hearer of the word, but, but not a doer also. And let us not laugh too hard at the Israelites, the elders of Israel here, because brothers and sisters, we do this. Right? We, we try and understand who God is, and we recognize what the Bible says about who God is. We recognize His sovereignty and His providence, His working together all things. And then we go and say, let me try and do this thing so that I can win some sort of victory in, in my life or so that I can try and overcome something. Let us be careful of this tendency in our lives. Let us be careful of this tendency in our, in our lives. We also see here the theme of sovereignty and providence, which is a key theme through 1 Samuel. You think 1 Samuel is heavy on this. That's, that's because 1 Samuel is heavy on this topic, right? The sovereignty and providence of, of God. And here we see that we've been looking at soteriology, a fancy word for God's work in salvation, right? We've seen that in chapters 1, 2, and 3. And, and here, the, the history of 1 Samuel takes this a step further and, and even admits that God is not only sovereign over who is saved and who is, not, who is not saved, but God is sovereign over the events of history. God defeats. God gives victory. God works things out according to the counsel of His own will. And so we see this 
doctrine of God's sovereignty expanded for us in, in the text of Scripture. And we see this difference between the work that God is doing and the work that we are doing, right? In chapter 2, we, we meet these two characters in the text, Hophni and Phinehas. They are priests, the sons of Eli. Scripture also calls them sons of Belial, sons of the devil. We see that in chapter 2. We also see in chapter 2 that it was God's desire to kill Hophni and Phinehas, to put them to death, and that is why they did not listen to wise counsel. That is why they continued in sin, because the Lord desired to put them to death. And we read in, in chapter 2 as well that God promises destruction on Eli's household, that Eli and his household will not be atoned for forever. And Hophni and Phinehas, they are not yet present in this battle. But we see this disconnect again between theology and practice, between belief and doing. And Hophni and Phinehas, they're going to be put to death when we get to verse 11 here. This means something pretty significant for us, doesn't it? In fact, I would say that it means something very significant for us. We will recognize something about God. But then we don't actually know God. I mean, look at even the Philistines in this text. And we'll get there, but they recognize the power of God, but they don't understand anything about who God is either. And we see this in our culture. And I, I, wish, I wish there was a more profound understanding in our society of God's sovereignty in all things. It's just an understanding that has escaped our culture and has escaped our society. And in fact, we, we see everywhere people trying to, to make excuses so they don't have to believe in the sovereignty of God. I think this is a travesty. But even those who do believe in God's sovereignty are still trying to earn in some way the favor of God. Let's bring the ark so the ark will lead us to victory. The power of God wasn't in the ark. The ark was a symbol. The power is with God, and God is holy. Verses 4 through 11. The evidence of God's true and real work in our lives. Verse 4. So, following the instruction of the elders, so the people sent to Shiloh, and from there they carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, who sits above the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. Do we, do we see how God is sort of working things out? I mean, even like this tendency in people is completely sinful, right? God, you are sovereign. Oh, let's try and do this ourselves by bringing the ark. And then God is even using the sin of the people to get Hophni and Phinehas onto the battlefield after God has already declared that they will be put to death. And you see God's providence working out here in the text? And it's, it's not like God sins, right? God doesn't sin. He doesn't have to sin to have authority over sin, Right? He works together, even the sins of the people, even the short-sightedness of the people. God, God works all of this together for His glory to accomplish His purpose, to accomplish His will. And we're like always scrambling, trying to figure things out and trying to, trying to make things work for us and trying to claim victory and trying to overcome. And God is the one working it all together. And this was certainly true for the Israelites here in this text. The duty, part of the job of the, the priests, was to carry the ark. So the Israelites are defeated in battle. Why did God defeat us? Let us bring the ark. And who has to come with the ark? Hophni and Phinehas. Marching to 
the certain death that we read about in verse 11. Verse 5. As the Ark of the Covenant of... By the way, I am so glad that God has authority over sin. If He didn't have authority over sin, He wouldn't be able to forgive it. If God didn't have authority over sin, He wouldn't be able to send Jesus to make atonement on our behalf for sin. Let us be thankful that God has authority over sin and that He truly does work all things together. Verse 5, As the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth resounded. The Ark is here! It's like, uh, well, you've seen movies. You know what this looks like. Thanks. I feel like those were courtesy laughs. That's all right. Thank you. Verse 6. When the Philistines heard... Hey, look. This text is so depressing. We've got to do something, all right? Verse 6. When the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What does the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood that the, the, oh no, the ark of the Lord has come into the camp. Verse 7, the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. They, haven't, they, they didn't bring that before, when we were fighting them before. They didn't bring that. This, nothing like this has happened before. Verse 8, Woe to us a second time. Who shall deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who smote the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. All the Philistines knew about God. They knew about the God of the Hebrews. They knew that He seemed to travel with this Ark of the Covenant. But they did not understand who God is. They did not know God. You see here that they're even referring to God as, as the gods of the Hebrews. Uh, there was only one God. They knew about God's power. They had learned about God's power over the previous 300 years leading up to to this story, leading up to this moment. These are the gods who smote the Egyptians. We see that as God has worked all things together, over the course of 300 years at this point, right? Bringing the Israelites out of Egypt and the Philistines, they were spectators to all of this. They were spectators to the Israelites in the wilderness. They were spectators as Joshua led the Israelites in and they and they began conquering city by city by city in the land of Canaan. They saw what the Hebrew God did, and they saw His power, and they were afraid of this God. And we see in the text that God, when He works things together the way that He does, He is the one who gets recognized even if the enemies in the land don't understand God and don't recognize God for who He is. They see His power. They see Him made evident. Because God quite literally puts Himself on display through His people through His true church here, pictured by the nation of Israel. And God is doing all of this for His glory. He's not doing so for the glory of the Israelites, right? The Israelites, they're losing this battle. They don't receive any glory for this, but God is already receiving glory. When the Philistines see His ark, and immediately, fearfulness. The entire Philistine community now God is God is wonderful. 
I mean, here we live in we live in, in Sunsides, Arizona. Every morning we get to walk out, out our front door and look at these amazing crisp mountains. And we realize that it's God who raised those out of the ground. That's cool. And God receives glory every time we enjoy the sight of those mountains. That it's God's paintbrush who paints the sky very beautiful shades of pink and purple and red and, and a new masterpiece every morning and evening there in the sky. That's our God doing that. And it's God who placed the stars in the heavens in such a way that we get to enjoy their light and we get to define constellations and we get to discover galaxies. And then if you're like me, you also, you also wonder what force is pushing the galaxies apart at such an extremely fast rate. But nobody else asks that question. All right, I'm alone here, I understand. This is God. God is the one who put all of this together. God is the one who receives glory. An author by the name of Indy Wilson describes it this way. I was looking at the, the tree, the tree outside, and I realized that God spoke that tree. He didn't just speak it into existence. No, that tree is it's the visible word of God. We don't understand it because we don't speak that language but we can observe it and we can know something about the God who speaks that tree. Look, God receives all glory as he paints the sky and as he speaks trees and as he ordains the events of human history. This is his story. He is the novelist. God is the master builder. God is the carpenter. He is not just the foreman. He is the one who, who does all of the work, right? God is the sculptor. God is the architect. God is holy and glorious. And the one who does all of this work, he sets the world in motion, stretches the heavens out around him like a tent, according to the scriptures. All things are from God. And through God and to God, all glory belongs to him forever and ever. Amen. That's, a, that's the end of Romans chapter 11. We are his workmanship. We are his workmanship put together for the purpose of the good works which have been prepared beforehand for us to walk in. We are His workmanship. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, by grace through faith. Not as a work of our own so that no one can boast. God is the one who receives all glory. And as He ordains the events of human history and the events of our lives and and as he leaves enemies in the land, he is doing this for his glory, not just among his own people, but among all people. And we see that here with the Philistines. And God is choosing and calling a people among the nations for himself. For himself. Verse 9, take courage like the Philistine generals on their horses with their flags marching across the battle line. Take courage! Take courage and be men! O Philistines, or you will become slaves to the Hebrews as, as they have been slaves to you. And the Philistines were so afraid they needed a pep talk from like the war generals. As they have been slaves to you, therefore be men and fight. So, the Philistines fought. And Israel was defeated. Again, a second time, Israel was defeated. And every man fled to his tent 
and the slaughter was very great, for there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. That's quite a bit more than 4,000. There fell from Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Just as God said he would work out two chapters earlier. This is a this is devastating. And this is the work that God is doing in First Samuel chapter four, at least through verse eleven. God has also promised that Eli will perish. And that hasn't happened yet. We haven't gotten there yet. Please bear with me next week. <laughs> this is the work that God is doing in this chapter. How do we know then that the Lord is working and that the Lord is moving? This is an important question in light of the text today, right? If the Lord is moving, is it always necessary that you can go and claim that victory and you can overcome. All you got to do is plead the blood and you can win this. Hmm. No. People were dying here. And God was working that together according to his plan. What is it like when God is actually working? And the world tells us that we'll feel better. We'll be spiritually energized. You'll have this amazing worship experience. Oh, look, God, He chooses a people for Himself. Here, again, Israel is always this pictorial prophecy in, in the Old Testament. They are the living parable of God's true church, right? God chooses a people for Himself, He calls people for Himself. And in response to God's calling, God's people are humble and they come to repentance. I'm going to say something this morning that is vastly different from what we hear most of the time, I think. I want to say if God is working and moving in our midst, we will experience divine defeat and we will be humble and we will be drawn to repentance before our God. And that's it. If we preach some version of the prosperity gospel or the, the word of faith gospel, we have to skip this whole passage of Scripture. I'm not willing to do that and I hope you are not willing to do that. And if we find that in our theology we have to skip over passages of Scripture, then it's probably the case that our theology isn't right. That's why when we read the Scriptures, the Scriptures defeat us, convict us, bring us to our knees in worship. That's why the preacher experiences great humility as he presents the text, because hey, he's just at the mercy of God. And that's it. And I hope that the Holy Spirit takes this message and causes us to understand, to hear the word of the Lord as the Lord has given it in His, in His Bible. All of creation declares His glory. Jesus would teach about this. And you have some people who are like, we don't need that Old Testament junk. We need to unhitch from the Old Testament. Well, Jesus taught about this. Sermon on the Mount. This is Sermon on the Mount material. This was our passage from this last Wednesday evening. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. Jesus teaches this in the context of his Sermon on the Mount. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Okay. Where moth and rust destroy... And where thieves break in and steal, you're familiar with this one. I'm sure you are. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, 
and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You can either claim victory over your life on this earth, or you can have victory in Christ. And I find this to be true, right? With Hophni and Phinehas, they exploited the law to build their own kingdom. The Israelites exploited the word of God, the power of God to try and win some sort of victory in 1 Samuel chapter 4. We, brothers and sisters, we will either exploit God's power and God's word to try and gain something, some victory in this world, some treasure on this earth, or we will surrender to God who spoke his word for our good. Well, those are the two options. Now, if we don't believe it, we'll continue to see the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then, if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And then the light that is in you is darkness. How great is that darkness? And then verse 24 no one it's an absolute statement not a single person no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to one and despise the other you cannot serve God and wealth and the word for wealth there is the Greek word mammon which is actually a literary personification of wealth. It means anything that you can gain in this world. It refers more to the motive of the heart than it does for the thing itself. And Jesus, here in this text, if you're claiming victory for yourself, if that's what you are concerned with, if, if that's what you are concerned with is just overcoming all of your problems and all of your enemies and all, everything that God has in the land for the sanctification, for the good of his people, if you are concerned with overcoming those things, then you have been convinced that your religiosity is light when in fact it is darkness. And if that light that you perceive within yourself is darkness, Jesus says, how great is that darkness? New Testament tells us exactly the same thing that the Old Testament does. Can't unhitch, can't separate from it. And Jesus taught it. We can't get away from that if we if we want to really follow Jesus. We want to really follow Jesus. And this is a deeply convicting truth, right? Like deeply piercing us between soul and spirit. This truth does that. The scriptures do that. This is also a freeing truth. Man, is this a freeing truth. That you don't have to try and get this big victory in this life. You don't have to do that. How freeing, right? that you don't have to somehow win the favor of God. How freeing is that? That's, that's an amazing truth. This is, why, this is why we don't preach some sort of weird, twisted, works-based righteousness. This is why we just teach the Bible, and the Bible presents us with what? The grace of God. And it turns out that all things are by God's grace. Not just some things, but all things are by the very grace of our, our God. You don't have to try and get this or win this or overcome this. God is the one who is in charge. This is quite different from this, this gospel of personal victory, right? We're debunking that right here. There's no real gospel of personal victory. I find that when I experience victory in my life, it's, it's, it's not my victory. God ruins that, right? It's, not my, it's God's victory. 
and I get to participate in the victory that God is winning for himself. And this is, this means more than this other stuff that the, Steve Lawson would say, than this other stuff. <laughs> it just means more, right? This is deeper. And it breeds a greater understanding of the world we live in. It, it causes this sort of understanding of God's sovereignty and His providence and all things and the work that He is doing. And when I'm able to see the evidence of the work that He is doing and, and my being brought to humility and to repentance, this just causes a sort of freedom that I can't describe to you. And we're no longer shackled by trying to win a victory, right? Or or in the very chains of, of the freedom we're trying to achieve. We're, they're not there anymore. Because this truth just causes us to be content. Helps us to grow in our faith, our trust in, in Christ, in God. Knowing that everything we suffer, everything we struggle through on this earth, it really is for a purpose. That purpose isn't our victory as we have defined our victory. Thank the Lord. It's so that God's people are being brought with God into God's victory as He accomplishes His own will. And in this text, that means that God is working things together in order to establish Jesus' throne within the creation. That's what all this is working toward. That's why... It's why God is transitioning between the time of the judges, Samuel being the last judge, and the time of the king. Samuel will ordain the first king, Saul, and then the first true king, David, after him. God, God is doing this, and then Jesus will come. He will fulfill all righteousness. He will become the atonement for the people of God throughout all time. In Christ, we receive forgiveness of sins. And Christ now has assumed his rightful place on the throne that has been prepared through 1 Samuel. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 says this, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will promise, it's a promise, an absolute promise, you will will be saved. And notice the wording there. Be saved. You will not save yourself. You will not win some sort of victory for yourself. It's not a works thing. You will be saved. Christ is the one who does the saving. He did not come to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. We see that. Look, if you don't know the Jesus who is doing this in Israel. If you don't know the Jesus who defeats people and humbles people and brings people to repentance and instead you, you know this other Jesus, this, this party feel good Jesus, I beg you, beg you to understand, to know Jesus for who he is to beg the God who grants understanding for this understanding. And that is the only, that is the only challenge I can make in response to this text. Please come to the God of grace. Please. And if sometimes we forget about God's sovereignty and like the Israelites, go back to some sort of works-based system, let us come before the Lord in repentance. Let us be humble. Let us ask forgiveness. And then let us continue to follow hard after Christ. He is our Savior. He is the only one worth following.